This is um, work we did back in uh, 2006 with Paul um, Nguyen uh, from the Ecole Normale Supérieure. And this is um, actually something quite different from everything you've seen so far. So you, know, you won't have to know anything about LWE or SIS. So um, it's about uh, uh, an attack we found on a certain signature scheme. Uh, signature schemes uh, known as DGH and Azure. Um, and I hope you, uh, it's something that's <coughs> kind of fun. I hope you uh, enjoy the, to see the attack. It's not too complicated based on the <coughs> geometrical idea. Um, so let me start by giving you the main idea of the attack before we go into any technicalities. Um, does anyone see anything here? No. Does anyone? Stop. Great. Yeah. Spot. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's from. Okay. Well, if you don't know, you don't know. Another thing I want to show you. Let's see. It. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well. Okay. So, okay. So, what's that? If, if you, if you're so smart. <laughs> it's not Spock. Yeah. So, so, so what do you see here? Cube. No, it's not a lattice. Yeah. <laughs> Someone said a cube, and do you see a cube? You can make it faster. Yeah. Now you see it? Okay, here. That should help you. It's really nice. Last time I gave a talk, this was really slow. Like rendering it took. No. <laughs> The new computer is, is very nice. <laughs> you can really see the cube. OK. Good. So this is actually the main idea of the talk. Um, and you'll see, uh, you see in a few minutes why. Like, you know, how to take something like that, just a set of points, and you know, see the shape, see the, the, the cube in the, in the set of in, in the points. So OK, let's go back to the presentation. Um, so in case you forgot, this is. This is a lattice. This is a two-dimensional one. Um, and we've seen that before. Uh, definition again, just in case you forgot. Um, you know, we have a basis, b1 up to bn, and we take um, all integer combinations of these vectors. OK, so this, this forms a lattice. You know that. I hope you know that. Um, and one of the problems I defined yesterday is the closest vector problem. Um, and just to recall, we don't need to know too much about it for, for this talk, uh, but just, you know, we have we're given the lattice, we're given this, this basis, you know, b1 up to bn, and we're also given a point u, and we're asked to find uh, the closest vector uh, to u, or, or a nearby vector. And in this case, this would be the answer. Okay, so this is the closest vector problem. Um, and as I said yesterday, it seems like a very difficult question. Um, kind of, in general, if you're trying to solve this, the best algorithms known take um, exponential time, two to the n time. Um, and you know that that's partly the, the idea behind using uh, lattices for crypto, and also the idea using for using them for signature schemes, as you'll see uh, in a few minutes. Um, however, um, this is again something we said yesterday. Checking if a point is part of a lattice, a point is in a lattice, is easy and how, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone wasn't focused there. But yeah, Gauss <laughs> elimination, yeah. OK, so you know how to do that. This is all, the only two facts we need to know. Yeah. OK. Um, so you know, the story, um, before I get to the actual story, I should say, um, uh, I should tell you how one can try to solve CVP. I think this came up yesterday in, during Vadim's talk. Um, and this is something, um, this is an algorithm uh, described or invented by uh, Baba in, in the mid 80s. Um, um, and the idea is actually pretty simple. Um, and wh what he said is the following thing. He said, you know, you have a point and you want to find nearby lattice point. So express the point as a linear combination of your basis vectors. So again, using Gauss elimination. Um, and then just you know, round each coefficient to the nearest integer. So take each of these alphas, and they're, you know, they're going to be arbitrary numbers, uh, and just round them to the nearest integer. Okay? So that's what I'm doing. This notation just means the nearest integer. So you round either up or down, depending on if it's bigger or smaller than half. And the fractional part is bigger or smaller than half. Okay? So 
And this seems to work quite well um, as long as your basis is somewhat good, somewhat small. So let's see a demonstration. Um, and actually, I'll, I'm, I'm going to analyze this algorithm, even though we don't really need that. But um, I'm going to analyze this kind of as preparation for Wednesday's talk. Um, it's also because it's nice to see it once. Um, but actually, what we need to have a good picture in mind is what, you know, what, this, algorithm, what this algorithm behaves like. Um, in particular, what I want to know is um, you know, what's the set of points uh, mapped um, to a particular lattice point. And this is, this is what the next picture shows us. So we're taking a lattice, and we actually we have this good basis. Now this is the you know, good basis, short vectors, and they're kind of orthogonal. Um, and now what, what the algorithm does, it you know, takes any point in space and expresses it in this basis and then rounds the coordinates. So if you think about it for a second, the set of points they map to the origin, map to zero, is exactly the one whose um, coefficients in that basis are at most half. And you know, if, if you think about it a bit longer, you see you have this kind of pattern. And you know, so the points in that marked area are those mapped to the lattice point in the center. This, those are exactly the points you know, whose coefficients in that basis are within plus minus half of, of that integer coordinate. Okay, so, um, it should be easy to, to see why that is the case. Um, okay, so that's what happens when you have a good basis. Um, question? Okay. And if you have a bad basis and you do the same algorithm, just with a different basis, um, you get a different picture, you get a much much worse performance. So you have see I have this basis here. Of course it can you know can be much worse. Typically the vectors are going to be much, much longer. I just want to um, get, use this for demonstration. So you know already here when you have slightly longer vectors, you see something bad happens. You know this area here is very long and in particular it contains points that are very far from like take the point here, somewhere here, it's going to be mapped very far to the center of that parallelogram. Um, you know, it should have been mapped here. This is the closest point, um, but somehow it's mapped all the way, all the way there. Okay, it's because we have a bad basis, and we, you know, we don't really do anything too sophisticated. We just round the coefficients, so it's not too surprising. Okay. Um, good. So let's just try to you know, talk a little bit about analysis. As I said, even though we don't really need that for the, the rest of this attack. So if you, you know, if you lose me the next slide, it's not a not a big deal. But let's try to think. Um, you should, just, yeah, should look here at the screen because I don't think the animation prints uh, on, the, on the handout. Uh, so what I'm trying to do now is to understand um, up to what kind of up to what radius can this algorithm find the nearest point. So how far away can I be from from the lattice point and still be able to find the nearest lattice point? So here is the grand animation. Uh, here is the area, and I guess this is what I'm, I'm trying to understand. You know, what's the biggest radius that's still going to be uh, mapped correctly to the point in the center? Okay. So, and this should be some function of the basis, right? If I have a good basis, there should be a bigger ball, should be a bigger radius. And if I have a bad basis, it should be a smaller uh, ball. And as, as you see here, it's pretty small. Um, in general, it's going to be much smaller. So let's try in the next slide to, to analyze this. So here's the radius. This is the radius of this length. This is the radius of correct decoding using this algorithm. Okay. And again, this isn't, doesn't really matter for the rest of the talk. So, but, but I think it's nice to see it, and it will be useful on Wednesday. Because what I'm going to introduce here is this very nice notion, um, you know, actually coming from mean algebra. It does, again, like Graham Schmidt, it doesn't have anything to do specifically with lattices, but it's nice. Uh, and it comes from in algebra, and it's very useful in, the, in connection with lattices. Uh, it's the notion of a dual basis. So if you have um, any basis, so it's like a plain mean algebra. If you have a basis b1 up to bn, one can define something called a dual basis. So okay, forget about lattices for a second. It's simply the basis defined but in the following way. Um, so it's b1 star, b2 star up to bn star, or bi star. Uh, it's the vector that is orthogonal to all the bj's, j not i, and has in the product one with, with bi. So I'll let you stir it a bit and try to think how this helps us analyze the algorithm without looking at the handouts. Okay, so maybe try to imagine this in a, I have this basis and say b1 is going to be orthogonal to. Uh, B1 star orthogonal to all the other BIs, 
and it has either product one with with B1 itself. It's a bit hard to imagine, but this this thing oh, this is a well-defined basis. It's known as a dual basis, and it has lots of nice properties like the dual of the dual basis is the original basis. <laughs> Actually, if you wish, I mean, it's much easier to write it succinctly in matrix notation. If I write B as the matrix whose columns are my vectors B, then the dual basis is simply the, essentially the inverse or, or the inverse transpose of B. Okay, this is easy to see why. Um, if we take the inverse, then the rows and the columns satisfy this um, inner product constraints. And I take the transpose, so it's again the columns versus the columns to satisfy the inner product constraints. It's easy to check. Um, anyway, why am I saying that? Because now we have this nice notion called the dual basis, and see how this helps us uh, analyze the algorithm. Because now, if you have, if I have a vector u, um, you know, and I write u as alpha one b one plus alpha two b two dot 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 alpha n b n. And notice that I can easily extract the alpha i's by just taking an inner product with b i star. So what the dual basis allows me to do is kind of extract the coefficients in the basis b i. Okay, again, this is basically an algebra. You might have seen it before and, and forgot, but this is, this is the way uh, it works. And, it, and you can easily see why this is the case, right? Just you know, plug in u, an expression for u in, in there, and you see that all the inner products, the B J B I star will cancel. The only one remaining is B I B I star, and that's one. So you just left with alpha. I. Okay. Good. So, so now you see that this dual basis is, you know, allows us to extract the coefficients in the basis in the basis B. And why is that so nice? Because now we can equivalently express um, in Baba's algorithm in the following way. Um, given a point U, I simply do the following thing. I output the point. Um, you know, the combination of the bi's whose, whose coefficients are just the, the round into the nearest integer of the inner product of u with the bi stars. Okay. This, is, this is a way to express the algorithm without going through the, you know, expressing u in the basis b explicitly. I just take the inner product and do it this way. Okay. And this is kind of a, a more succinct way of writing the algorithm. And also, using, you know, once you write it this way, it should be easy to figure out the correct decoding radius. Okay, so let's try to let's try to see um, what the decoding radius is. So take take for instance the origin, you know, take the the, the zero point the origin, and try to figure out you know, how far away can I go while still decoding to the origin. Okay, so to to be, to be able to decode to the origin, all these coefficients should be zero. Okay, those all these rounded coefficients should be zero. In other words, all the inner products with the bi stars must be between plus half, plus half and minus half. Okay? In other words, the area mapping to zero is kind of the intersection <laughs> of slabs um, determined by the bi star. And that's essentially what we see in the picture. If I go back, you'll see in the picture that, um, let me go to the previous one, it's easier to see it there. Uh, here. So you see that the area is simply interse the intersection of two things, and each of these slabs is determined by the UI, by the BI stars. Okay. So the BI star is really kind of the normal to that, to that, um, um, to, you know, to those uh, half, uh, to those uh, subspaces, those hyperplanes. Okay. And this essentially answers our question because the radius we can now go is simply um, half of, you know, um, the uh, one over the longest of these vectors. Okay, and, and why is that? Because each vector gives us a slab, and um, the, the width of the slab, or, uh, or the distance of the slab from the origin, is one over two mag, uh, uh, one over two norm of bi star. And you know, the closest point I can go to and, and leave the decoding area is is that. It's, it's kind of the, the smallest of all these radii, which is one over two max of bi stars. Okay, so this is this tells me the, the radius under which I can guarantee to decode correctly uh, a perturbation from, from the lattice. Um, uh, and I should say, if, if you know, this this kind of algorithm is actually used a lot in practice, like in you know, decoding cell phone, um, you know, cellular communication, um, and and there they they use you know, similar algorithm and they need good basis and you know they can do things like LLN to find to find good basis. Um, so these things do, are used in practice, uh, things like um, MIMO and stuff like that. Okay, so it's not a topic of this talk, of course. Uh, one last thing I want to mention, this is again in preparation for Wednesday's talk, is that 
Um, and once you have a dual basis, you can start asking, does it also generate a lattice? Well, of course it generates a lattice, it's a basis, it's a set of any independent vectors, and the, and the lattice generates is not surprisingly known as the dual lattice. And this is something uh, I didn't mention yesterday, but it's, it's actually underlying many of the things we've seen. This notion of a dual lattice is quite important, um, and tomorrow, uh, on Wednesday, sorry, will play a crucial role. So this, this dual lattice is going to show up again on Wednesday. Um, and um, well, we'll, I'll describe it more in Wednesday. I should, I should say that it's, it's well defined in the sense that you, know, you can take a different basis of, of, a, of a lattice and the dual basis generates the same dual lattice. So, so it's really a well defined notion and for each lattice there is this dual lattice that, that one can define and has lots of nice properties, lots of important um, theorems you can prove about that. But it's not, again, not the topic of today's talk. All we have to know for today's talk is this, you know, CVP, um, that, you, know, you can solve CVP if you have a good basis, um, and you can figure out if a point is in the lattice, um, you know, even if you don't have a good basis. You can easily figure out if a point is in the lattice. Okay, so just a quick refresher on signature schemes, digital signature schemes. Uh, I'm not going to, to include here the formal definition. I'm sure you've, you've all seen it many times before. Let me just quickly uh, remind you that a signature scheme um, you know, consists of three algorithms. There's a key generation algorithm that produces the public and the private key. Um, the signing algorithm that, you know, given a message, produces, and also the private key produces the, the signature, a signature. And there's a verification algorithm that uses only public information using um, the public key. And, and then given a message and a signature, can verify if um, the signature corresponds to the message. Okay, so, you know, this is just the um, description of the algorithms. I, I'm not going to describe the security notions, and there are several security notions. This is important. And the reason I'm not going to do it is because I'm not going to construct signature schemes, now, but, to, but to break them, and you'll see clearly that, um, um, that it breaks any reasonable uh, security definitions. So, so I won't bother with, with the security definitions, but you, know, you, you should know there are, ways, there are several ways to define signature schemes, and this is, this is an important notion. Um, I should also say that um, there are um, kind of black box ways of constructing signature schemes, um, say using one-way functions. So we could, in principle, use what um, uh, you know, Vadim and Chris showed us yesterday uh, on SIS and construct signature schemes and we would know they're secure. And, and that's very good, but to actually to make them efficient uh, is not obvious. And this is you know, part of the, the, the work people are doing today. Uh, Vadim mentioned he's working on this also today. Um, these days, um, these um, constructive signature schemes is, is still one of the important open questions in this area. Very efficient signature schemes. Um, as you see, we'll be dealing here with in this the things we're attacking here. It, it has these signatures of size, uh, like you know, like less than 2,000 bits. So it's, it's really truly efficient things that we're trying to achieve here. Okay, so um, so once we know what signature schemes are, let's talk about a specific one we'll be dealing with here, and this is this dates back to 97. It's a signature scheme suggested by, by Golda, Goldwasser, and Halevi. It's not, it's, not it's not a signature, not a specific one, but actually a, um, a, a, a framework for several possible signature schemes. You can instantiate different lattices in it. Um, but the basic idea is, is very nice. In some sense, the same basic idea later was used in, in constructions of of uh, provable uh, signature schemes, those that are believed to be uh, secure, um, but um, you know there are several more ideas needed. Um, and the, the signature scheme they presented was it's, it's mainly the, there was no security proof, there was no um, you know claim to relate this to any established hard problem, and you know as you see this had indeed um, you know flaws uh, as you see in this talk. So there was. There was no security proof, and this indeed was there was indeed a very big problem in that in that uh, signature scheme. But the idea is, is still very uh, useful, and, and still shows up in other constructions uh, of, of lattice-based signature schemes. And the idea is that um, you know CVP is hard if you don't have the right basis. But once you have the right basis, it's it's easy. That's what we saw before. You can, if you have a good basis of a lattice, you can do solve uh, find near, nearby points. And this is what what the idea was. Okay. This is it's a very nice idea, and here is how they suggested to use it. So here is a scheme. Um, so you start uh, in the key generation by generating two bases of the same lattice. Okay, so you take, you choose a lattice with two bases. The private key is going to be a good basis, a short vector, somewhat orthogonal, 
and the public key is going to have be some kind of bad basis. Okay. Um, you know, there are some details to fit in here. Um, uh, for instance, you know, how, how to choose this basis. And indeed, they suggested some options, and, and you see later um, there are other, uh, more, even more efficient options suggested by Entry. Um, but this doesn't matter too much for this, for this talk. There are several ways to make this precise. Um, for instance, there's a nice way to choose a bad basis uh, you know, you, by bringing the, the basis into a canonical form known as the Hermit normal form. This is something Vadi mentioned yesterday. This was discovered a few years later by Michancho. Um, but anyway, the, the idea is that you have two bases, one good, one bad. Okay. Now, how do you sign? So I have a message. You know, someone gives you an email. You want to sign the email. Um, and you have a private key. You have a good basis. So the, the idea is to first you map this is a standard step. I won't, you know, I won't describe this in detail. Use some kind of random work. You have some other hash function. You map, you map the message to a point in space. So think of the message as being some random point in space. And there are ways to do it. Just you know, think of the message as being some sequence of coordinates. And you know, now you have a point in space. And now you, you apply Baba's algorithm to find a nearby lattice point. And you can do it because you have a good basis. You have the private key. So you have a good basis. You can find a nearby point. And finally, if you want to verify, now you give it a message and you give it a, you know, the, the, the signature and you want to verify the signature is, is correct, um, you know, all you have to do is simply check the signature is, is indeed a lattice point. And as I said in the beginning, this you can easily do. You don't need a good basis for that. You just do Gaussian elimination. And the second thing you want to do is check that the signature is, is close to the message. Okay? And this is also easy to do, right? You just you know, take the difference and look at the norm of the vector. Right? You can easily check, you can easily compute the distance between two points. Um, and that's basically the idea. So let's say it graphically. Um, here's the idea. Um, so we have two bases. We have the private key as a good basis, and we have the public key as a bad basis for the same lattice. And the public key is just there to allow verification, to allow to check that the point is in the lattice. Um, I have some email I wrote, and now I just map it to a point in space. So you know, imagine it landed over there. Um, that's my message. And if I want to sign, I simply apply Baba's algorithm, and I get that uh, lattice point marked over there. Okay, the, the lattice point is center of that parallelogram. Okay, and it's going to be close to the to the, my message, right? By because I have a good basis. Okay. Okay. Now I don't have the private key anymore. Okay. Now I'm I'm just uh, using the public key, and I want to verify the signature. Um, you know, all I do is I, I look at these two points, and um, I check that the, uh, the center point that I check is silly, that the signature is silly, um, is, is the lattice point, which I can do efficiently. And I also look, you know, uh, I measure the distance between the two, and I check, OK, this should be somewhat small. And that's basically the idea. OK, is that clear? How is the mapping run? Because that seems to be everything on HP map. From the email the to the point. It allows you to just take the lattice point and perturb it slightly and on the turn, right? Well, why? No, so Right, so, so the, way, the way I would do the mapping is using some kind of so random function. So you would take a hash function, a random oracle. Okay, you don't want this mapping to have any properties. You want to really land in the, in the random place. Yeah. Um, right, if, if the mapping brings you very close to that point, then. Okay. Um, okay, so again, the idea, the message, think of the message as, you know, by just writing some of the message randomly, it's a point in space, and I just round it to a near, nearby point. That's the, that's the idea. And you know, it seems like a reasonable idea. It's based on a hard problem, right? It's based on CVP, but that's, that's a meaningless statement. It's, it's related to CVP. It's not really based on CVP in any <coughs> possible sense. Um, but you know, it gives us kind of this warm feeling inside. It's a CVP, and it's a hard problem. It takes exponential time. <coughs> yeah, good question. OK, so this has to be specified based on the instantiation, uh, based on the lattice you take. Typically, what you do, um, you know, so again, it, it, it depends on the particular instantiation. But if you have, for instance, this basis, you just take the um, diameter of that um, parallelogram and use this as, uh, as a parameter. So this is going to be one of the public parameters. This is the distance. Uh, but usually, what happens, the bad basis is so bad that you know, we, it seems like without using the private key, you can't get anywhere near that. You know, the, so if you think about closest vector problem, the best we know how to do is something like LLL, and that gives us an exponential approximation. So the, the nearest point we find is you know, not anywhere near that. It's going to be like 2 to the 100 away from that. 
So, so this is going to work in a finite uh, subset of this lattice. Uh, when you map to a random point, you cannot really map to a random point. That's true. Think of a very fine grid. Yeah, think of this as a very fine grid of space. You know, of course, there's some accuracy issue, but this is not the main issue here. No, oh. There is no uniform distribution. Oh, OK. At that time, yeah, I mean, these days you would do it differently. In the new signature schemes, yeah, so there's no way, space, no way to have uniform distribution over the entire space, right? So I think at that time, they just bound in some big box, right? But today, you don't need that. There's other ways to do it. And I'm not sure, will Chris, will you mention any of this? Signature, you won't mention signature schemes in your talk. Right. Oh, you will. As, as part of the sampling. Okay, good. So you'll see more of it later today. Good. Um, okay, so that's. Okay, so some details I'm hiding, but is the, the only thing you need to know is the, the idea, the, um, the basic idea. Um, okay, we already saw this. And here's, here's Entry Sign. So Entry Sign, um, this is the Wikipedia page before our uh, paper appeared. And the Entry Sign is um, essentially you can think of it as an instantiation, a very sophisticated, very clever instantiation, instantiation of, of that. Um, um, a GGA signature scheme, and they, they suggested to use very specific um, lattices with lots of nice properties. It's actually ingenious constructions that, that ter turn out to be, um, you know, amazingly uh, efficient. Uh, uh, you, you only have to you have, have to use a very small number of bits to to actually um, represent such lattices. So this is and this lattice is uh, still very useful for other application today, um, but. That time, the company, the company entrance suggested um, uh, to use this for for signature schemes. To use their to lattices for signature schemes. Um, so, just a few more details. This, this originates in, in the um, um, paper by Hofstein, Hargrave, Graham, uh, Piper, Silverman, and White in 2001. Um, there are actually only five authors, so not six. Um, and it's essentially, as I said, it's a very efficient implementation of, of GGH. Uh, I won't tell you exactly how this works. It's actually quite sophisticated. Um, and what they managed to get is signature lengths that are ex amazingly short. It's like uh, essentially uh, you know, less than 2,000 bits. Uh, it sounds even less in, in, in bytes, um, even less in kilobytes. Um, so, and and uh, it's apparently people really care about this, you know, they care because they want to use this for you know, uh, uh, you know, little chips that store this, the keys, and they're able to do signatures. And it's amazingly efficient. Also, computation is very efficient. Um, it's you know, even faster than RSA-based methods. Um, and, okay, I won't go into technicalities. At that, the time, there was an attempt to make it uh, standard using the, uh, under the I IEEE. Uh, I think by now this has been abandoned. Um, and all the, at 2002, there were some flaws pointed out. But it seemed like this can be, at that time, it seemed like this can still be a valid signature scheme. Okay. So I guess that's, that's it for the intro. Um, and now, um, oh, I, I should actually, um, so, maybe, okay, so let me go to our main result, and so the main result is essentially um, we found an inherent uh, security flaw. There's a serious flaw in all these signature schemes based on GGH, and it, you see it's actually, it's not a difficult one. It's, um, once you see it, it seems even uh, simple, but the reason it wasn't observed before is, is mainly because it's different from the way people thought about entry and, sign uh, and the entry signature scheme. It's more geometrical and less uh, algebraic. So uh, um, that's, I guess, why it was not observed before. Um, uh, but it kind of mainly serves, again, the purpose is to show you how important it is to have some security proof. So, you know, you want to have some security, some guarantees on your signature scheme or you, in general in your cryptographic construction. Um, and what, what we did, we actually did some experiments. Um, um, you know, we actually managed to attack GGH in, in high dimensions, dimension 400, and then also attacked Entry Sign dimension 502. Um, um, and this, you know, this experiment, we, we, we thought it would take a long time. We need lots of processors. Um, and actually, it was amazingly fast. It took a few seconds, and we managed to recover the, the private key and, and you know, using only 400 signatures. So. Um, the way the attack works is you see in a minute, but you, you get some, you get a bunch of signatures, and you manage to extract the private key from those signatures. You see in a minute how this is done, and it really just, um, you know, uh, say a few minutes, or depending on the parameters. But it was, it, it was really fast, uh, very fast to attack uh, to find the private key. 
And uh, I mentioned more, more about this at the end, but let me already say there are some possible countermeasures already at the time that suggested how to improve the signature scheme, how to improve it against those attacks, um, something on perturbations, um, increase the entries in private key. We'll get back to that at the end. Uh, and I guess the most important uh, outcome of this is, is um, provably secure signature schemes. And this is what Chris will describe later today. Um, it's, it turns out that using these ideas and some extra ideas that we developed in the last few years, you can actually construct signature schemes with security, with provable uh, security, um, that aren't that much uh, different conceptually, but you, know, th you have to do it more carefully to avoid, avoid all these um, pitfalls that, that, uh, that, that happened here. Um, I should also say, okay, there's, a, there's attack, but the attack is not against let's be crypto in general. So what you saw yesterday, SIS and LW, these are still secure. Okay, this is an attack against a very specific implementation of, um, of, of a lattice-based crypto system. It's not an attack against um, you know, any possible um, lattice-based crypto system, of course. Uh, in particular, another, another encryption system, a certain encryption uh, scheme by, by the same company, by entries, is still secure. So it's, the attack is really against the signature scheme um, by entry and GGH, but not, you know, not anything else. Okay. Finally, uh, I think you're ready to see the attack. Good. So here it is. So, so, so it's okay. Now you should should not look at the handouts because uh, not because I'm hiding something, but because it's animation. Uh, the attack is this. Okay. So let's think what happens here. So we have, um, you know, we have a signature scheme. We have a, a signing algorithm that takes a message. Um, and signs and signs signs the, signs the message. Uh, in other words, find near a lattice point. So we, we don't know the private key. So we, we don't see that, right? We just we just have a public key. So we kind of we don't have any idea uh, what the geometry is like. But but now what we see essentially we essentially see two points. Okay, we don't know anything about geometry. We only see two points. There's the lattice point, the signature, and the message, a nearby point. So what can we do with them? Well, I don't know, but let's, you know, let's keep them for later. Okay? So I'll just take them and move them aside. Okay, if you miss that, here again. We have a message and a signature. Okay? So we kind of listening, and someone, uh, like the company, signs another message. Okay, so we get another message signed. So I don't know what to do with it, let's keep it aside, but you know, put it aside in such a way that the signature is aligned. So you see what I'm going to do now. Okay? By putting it on the same signature. I can do that, right? It's just a vector. So, again, I take the two points, I take the vector, the, the, the difference between the two points, and I put it in the same position again. Let me know when you have enough, yeah. <laughs> I actually don't remember. I think it at some point stops. <laughs> Okay, maybe you know, we have the handouts. Um, but you see, maybe you starting to see the idea. The idea is that these points, once I have enough of them, are going to form a certain shape. And that shape is exactly the Baba decoding area. It's exactly that parallel pipe used by the signer, by, this, by the signature algorithm, by the signing algorithm, right? So this is, um, I won't show this again, I'll, I'll just you know, allow you to imagine, it. once I have more points, you know, I'm slowly starting to see that, that shape. And the question then is, you know, can you really see the shape from random points sampled from the side of shape? Yeah. Is the Verifying distance, the, the maximum distance here, the maximum radius or the minimum? The verifier, um, you mean the, the parameter the verifier uses, it, it actually doesn't really matter for this, but um, usually it's the maximum. Because you want, you want the value signature all to succeed, yes. So it can even be more than the maximum, um, no reason for it, but yeah, it can be even more than the maximum if you wish. Because uh, I mean, at least it was believed that you know, any attacker would have to use very, very, you know, would have to if if an attacker were to solve CVP, would have to use very far distances. It's just, if it's more than the maximum, you could occasionally give the wrong lattice point. 
um, and still and still have yeah. So it, for some application, this might help. And actually, okay, we'll see later in Chris talk how this is done today. But yeah. Okay, so this essentially what uh, again the idea is again I collect a bunch of signatures and I take the 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 difference between the signature and the message and just collect all these vectors together and then here's what we end up with. So it's something I, I would call the hidden parallel pipe problem. Okay, and if we solve this, we're done. This is what we need to solve. So given points sampled uniformly from an n-dimensional centered parallel pipe you know, find the parallel pipe bit. So it's not immediately obvious this is possible. I mean, if you know anything about high dimensions, usually things are difficult in high dimensions, right? You have exponentially many directions. You know, lattice problems are, are difficult. You know, things become difficult in high dimensions. Um, but as you see, actually, this is something you can solve. This is something you can solve. And um, you know, once we solve this, we can break the signature schemes. OK? Um, and let's see how we solve that. So here's a picture. You know, I sampled uh, a large set of points. Actually, in practice, the amazing thing is, even though we were in the much higher dimension, like dimension 500, we only needed 400 points. This was actually due to observation William White uh, had um, to some symmetries in the basis. But anyway, this is this is a demonstration of what we're trying to do. We're kind of trying to find the the parallel pipe that uh, kind of bounds these points. So before we do that, let's do something easier. Let's try to find um, kind of a cube. Try to find uh, a cube that uh, given samples from the cube. Okay, so now it's a special case. You don't have to worry about parallel pipes. Uh, just cubes. But the cube is not axis aligned. It's, it's rotated. <laughs> so there's still something to do. It's not completely obvious. Um, so here's a two-dimensional demonstration. We have you know, a bunch of points sampled from, in this case, a square. And we want to figure out where the square is. In two dimensions, it's obvious. You see the square. Um, but in higher dimensions, it requires um, something, some algorithm. And so here's the first idea we tried. Um, this is a quite a natural idea. And um, you know, it, it actually it, it fails. But, but the idea is to use essentially what's known as a covariance of a distribution. Maybe you remember that from probability uh, sometime in your undergraduate or graduate studies. But uh, the idea is simply this. Let's define. So now think of x as being distributed uniformly inside that cube, right? X are those vectors we, we, we have as input, okay? And I'll take a unit vector u. So think of u as some fixed unit vector. And what I want to do is define the variance of the distribution in the direction of u. And the way I define it, I project on u. Meaning, I just take the inner product with u, and I take the expectation of the square. I take the, the second moment of this. I take the expectation of the square of the inner product with u. OK. And the reason I'm doing it is because I'm hoping to see some difference in certain directions. I'll have maybe some information telling me where the cube is. And maybe if I compute this variance of u in many directions u, I could maybe really find out where the cube is. That was at least the idea. But as you see from this short calculation, it actually fails. And let's, let's see why this calculation, it looks scary, but it's actually not that difficult. It's, uh, I want you to get used to it, because we'll later see a slightly more difficult calculation. So what are x? x are samples from a rotated cube. Okay. So one way to write it is to say x is u times y, where y are sampled from the standard cube, from minus 1, 1 to the n. This is simply the axis aligned standard cube. And now u is an orthogonal matrix, a rotation matrix. Okay, so x is simply u, a rotation applied to the standard cube. Okay, the point sampled from the standard cube. And now let's try to compute that quantity, the, the variance of u. So what's the variance of u? Is the, as defined above, it's the expectation of the square of the inner product between my samples x and the fixed vector u. Um, you know, and I can just write this out as, as um, so in a product of u and x is u transpose x, and which is the same as x transpose u. And I just write it out like that. So the expectation <coughs> of u transpose x times x transpose u. Okay, now let's see. Let's recall what x is. So x is capital U times y. So I can write it as 
little u transpose capital U, y, y transpose capital U transpose u. And the thing to notice is now the u's are all fixed. Okay, the u's are fixed, only the y's are random variable. Okay, this expression is linear in that. So I can, I can take out the u's. You know, everything is okay here. I'm doing expectations here now on, on matrices, but this is, this is fine. So y, y transpose is, is actually a, a matrix. This is a, y is a column vector. Um, but everything is fine. Uh, this all works out okay. So I get uh, you know, u transpose u, expectation of y, y transpose. And you know, if you compute the expectation of uh, y, y transpose this matrix, you get it's exactly um, uh, identity over 3. So it's diagonal with the thirds, with thirds on the diagonal. Right. Why is that? Uh, so what is y, y transpose? It's a matrix that contains in location ij the product of you know, yi and yj. But, but if you think of y, the coordinates are independent. Uh, each one is independently chosen from minus 1, 1, from the interval minus 1, 1. So all the off diagonal entries are clearly 0, because expectation of yi, yj is expectation of yi times expectation of yj, and, and just both are 0. So only the diagonal ent entries remain, and the diagonal entries are 1 third, because that's, you know, that's expectation of this variable squared. It's 1 third. Okay? That's the variance of, of, this, of this random variable. Good, so there's some calculation here, um, and essentially what we ended up with is um, you know, uh, U and U transpose, and those are orthogonal matrices. Uh, U is an orthogonal matrix, so it cancels, and we just left with U transpose U, and U is a unit vector, so U transpose U is just one, and we left with one third. Bottom line, for all vectors U, for all unit vectors U, we get a third. And this is bad news, it means that we really don't have any information there. Right? The hope was that if I change, as I change u, I might see something, but I really don't see anything. Okay, and I, I won't repeat Chris's mistake because I know you know what the answer is. Here's the second attempt. Instead of doing the second moment, the idea, and this is what made everything work, the idea is to go to the fourth moment instead of the second moment. And essentially what we're doing here is we're repeating the same thing, but instead of during the second moment, we'll consider now the expectation of inner product of ux to the power 4. And let me just try to give you the intuition for this. Um, you, know, you do the calculation, it's not much more difficult, you can do it. It's a nice exercise. And you see that this quantity, it's called the kurtosis, it, it, is, it depends on the direction of the vector u. Um, the, the exact formula is over there, it's 1 third minus 2 over 15 times the sum of the coordinates to the power 4. So what does that mean? It means that, um, let's start maybe, okay, let's start with the first one. If you're in the direction of a corner, if, if, if the vector u is in the direction of one of the corners of the cube, so the vector u is, um, say, 1 over square root n everywhere, 1 over square root n, 1 over square root n, 1 over square root n, then the sum of the ui to the power 4, so ui to the power 4 is 1 over n squared, because the coordinates are 1 over square root n, so the, so the coordinates to the power 4 is 1 over n squared, and we're summing n of them. So it's just 1 over n. It's a very small quantity. So it's essentially 1 third. So if you go in the direction of the corners, you get 1 third. But if you go in the direction of the faces of the cube, the coordinates there are 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. OK? So the coordinates, again, in, in, that, in that rotated cube, that the coordinates are 1, 0, 0, 0. Hence, you get 1 third minus 2 over 15. And this is 1 fifth. So something good happens. The, the, we see a difference you know, if we point it towards a face or somewhere towards the corner, and that's good news. It means we can maybe hope to find the, you know, the, the, the uh, orientation of that cube. And that's what we, we, we actually, that's what, exactly what we do. Um, just to give some intuition why this happens, because you don't see it there from the, from the formula. Uh, and the intuition is this. If you're pointing towards a face, so if I have a cube, I have points sampling the cube, and I have a I have a U pointing towards the face. So it kind of goes straight through the cube, um, through the faces of the cube. And I project the distribution I see, the distribution of inner product of U and X is simply like that, like that uh, interval over there, simply uniform in minus 1, 1. Right? I mean, you can easily see it. If I project on one of the axes, I get uniform distribution minus 1, 1. Okay? Because you know, one of the, each of the coordinates is independent minus 1, 1. But if, on the other hand, I project in the direction of one of the corners, so my vector does not go toward the face, but go, goes toward the corner, then if you 
think about that. So think about it in a product. What you actually end up getting is a sum of n independent random variables, each one being uniform between minus one and one. And if you remember, central limit theorem tells us that if you sum lots of independent things, it starts to become a normal variable. And, and that's indeed what we get there. So if you actually do the calculation, you see, you get something very close to normal distribution. And normal distribution, the fourth moment differs from the fourth moment of the uniform in minus one one. And that's why we see this difference in the cortosis. In the second moment, we see no difference because both have the same variance. They have the same second moment, but luckily they don't have the same fourth moment. So we can stop there. And now let's try to recover the, the cube. Let's try to solve the problem. Yeah. Do you get any information just by looking at the maximum? Like the, the vectors you have, does those? The minimum. The, the one fifth is. Uh, no, but when you have the, the whole uh, bunch of uh, vectors, if you just look at the longest, shouldn't those oh, be good, more or good, less good. the good. edges? Oh, good. I should have said, yeah. So, so some of maybe, um, yeah. So the, um, the trouble, I should say, trouble in n dimensions is that you, know, you have no hope of ever really getting close to a corner or something like that. Right? Think of a point sample from the cube. Each coordinate is minus 1, 1 uniformly. The probability of having all coordinates close to 1 is exponentially small. It, it, just, it will never happen. You will never have a point close to the corner. Um, I'm not saying this won't work. Maybe something like that would work. But um, in high dimensions, it seems like there's very little you can do. And, um, but it really is one of the things we tried. Yeah, and this, this didn't work. Yeah. Trying to actually look at the distances of the points and try to, from that, figure out the, the orientation. Yeah, great question. Um, good. Any other questions? Yeah. So the idea is kind of to look at more um, uh, okay, like a, this more statistics of the information, not the information directly. This seem to help. So to summarize, here is the algorithm. Uh, we simply start from some random direction, and we, we're trying to minimize that kurtosis. I should say we can we could compute the kurtosis, simply the expectation over x. So we have samples from x. We can try to, well, not, not exactly compute, but approximate. And here's how we do that. So we just do a gradient descent. So you know, just you know, shift u as long as this improves. I'm not, I won't show you the details, but you can do it rigorously. So you take u, and you, you, know, you can change u as long as that value goes down. And you have to make sure that the errors don't kill you, because there are errors, and you have to make sure you deal with them. But if you do it carefully enough, you end up with a face. And now, each time you apply this algorithm, you get one of the 2n phase vectors. And you apply it, you know, apply it 2n times, or n times, or n log n times. You know, after a couple of times, you get all the faces, you know, and you know what the orientation is like. This is the end of the learning the cube part. Um, so the, the only many thing is now to figure out how to learn the more general case, the parallel pipid. Um, so now we have. Um, to work slightly harder, but it's actually it's not more difficult, just slightly more notation. Um, what we have now is an is arbitrary parallel pipid, uh, which um, can be written in the following way. So x, uh, the samples from the parallel pipid, it can be written as r times y. And r is simply the, you know, the, the vectors that generate the parallel pipid. These are the basis vectors, uh, as we had yesterday. Uh, and y is simply uh, uniform between minus 1, 1, each coordinate. So, so a parallel pipe is simply a linear transformation of a cube. And this is what I'm writing there. Uh, but the thing is, we don't know r. Right? And, and what I'm, I'm showing you here is actually you can recover r. You can find r simply from the samples you get. You can kind of find the shape of the parallel pipe given the samples. And for that, it turns out what you have to do, you have to use the second moment. You have to use what, we, what didn't work for the cube actually is going to work here. It's going to allow us to transform uh, the problem into a cube. So let's see how we do that. You consider the, the matrix x, x transpose. So this is, this is what's known as the covariance matrix. You take the expectation of x, x transpose. And if you write this out, so x is r times y. You write this out as before. You get r times expectation of y, y transpose times r transpose. And y, y transpose, we did it before. It's simply identity over 3. So we end up with r times r transpose. And now it's the arbitrary matrix. Okay. Um, and this is the nice thing is something we can estimate. We can compute that. We can just take lots of samples x and compute the expectation of x, x transpose. And it gives us well, an approximation of that. Um, and it gives us r, r transpose. Okay. Good. So we have r transpose. And from that, it turns out we can, uh, this is something we can already use. So let s be r, r transpose, which is something we can compute. Um, you know, sometimes this is called the ground matrix of r. 
So S is in some sense the, the, the square of R. Um, I, so I don't know how well you remember this from in algebra, you know, positive semi-definite matrices. Turns out what you need to do now is, is to consider the matrix um, the square root of S inverse. So square root is well defined, it's a positive semi-definite matrix. Um, so you take the square root of S inverse um, times R. Okay, so you know, if you forgot the reason this works is because this, um, uh, once you multiply R by the square, the inverse of, of, of square root of S, um, you end up with an orthogonal matrix. Okay, so this is basic um, mean algebra. So um, square root of S inverse R, if you just you know, write it out, you'll see that this is an orthogonal matrix because you multiply it by its transpose and you get identity. Okay? Why is that useful? Because this tells us that m applying this matrix, square root of S inverse, does the following thing. And this is the main idea. If we apply the transformation S inverse square root, what we're essentially doing is doing this, taking the parallel pipette and shrinking it back to a cube. The cube is not going to be axis aligned, but at least it's going to be a cube. Okay? And again, the reason this works is because, as I said before, S inverse times, S inverse half, S to the minus half times R, um, this is orthogonal. Okay? And because it's orthogonal, we know the samples we have, so if we apply s to the minus half to x, we end up with samples that are s to the minus half r y, and s to the minus half r is an orthogonal matrix, uh, so it's simply a rotation of the cube. Okay, so I hope you managed to follow that. And if not, this is, this is what you end up doing. Some linear transformation that brings an arbitrary parallel pipette into a cube. Uh, now we can run the previous algorithm, figure out what the cube is like, you know, find that orientation, and from that, we cover back by multiplying by, um, now multiplying by square root of s, we're covering everything, we're covering r. Okay, so that's it. Um, uh, that's that's for, the, for the attack. Uh, but I, I have also an interesting uh, story to say before, before I end. And this is that, um, you know, uh, this was like two days before the deadline for the conference and, and Fong, my co-author, calls me uh, and says, you really want to, uh, look at that book. And uh, I don't have the book. I run to the library, I look at the book, and here's the book. Uh, it's a book called Independent Component Analysis. And it's from statistics. I have no idea how we found it. Um, uh, and that book, you know, the more I look, the more worried I become. <laughs> that book uh, essentially describes a similar problem. So in people in statistics already looked at, um, uh, and they actually have a different reason to look at these problems. But it's, it's actually interesting. It's a very interesting uh, application in statistics. So it's, it's been called, there they call it independent component analysis, ICA. If you know PCA, it's a very famous statistical method, and this is kind of the, the uh, analog of this uh, for higher moments. Um, and they have some algorithms that are similar to ours. Um, however, the algorithms are you know, not rigorous, not analyzed, um, but do seem to perform well in, in practice. So, so I mean, we have, um, uh, it, was, it was nice to see that people have seen, thought of similar things before, and the applications are extremely nice, I think. So here's the, the application they used. Um, they actually, there's a demonstration on the website. So um, the, what they use is the following thing. So it's called the cocktail party problem, or one variant of this. So um, you know, there's a party, and there are several groups, and they all talk together. Um, you know, like so, say uh, three groups, and you know, each. They each talk separately, and you're trying kind of to uh, listen in to what the conversations are about. So you put a couple of microphones here and there in the room, um, you know, but you don't put the microphone exactly in the middle of the conversation. So you're going to put a microphone here and there and there. And each microphone grabs a different mixture of the conversation. So you know, a microphone over there gets you know, half of the conversation here, a third of the conversation there, and say you know, one eighth of the conversation over there. So each microphone has a different calibration of the various conversations. Um, and what they managed to do using these algorithms is separate out the conversations. So um, they use a signal from the, say, three microphones, and they're able to find the right combination to cancel the, uh, to separate each conversation alone. So there's actually very nice demonstrations. You hear, you hear each of the original signals, and you can't make sense of it, because it's like three conversations together. They actually do it with more, like five, six. And um, after they apply the algorithm, you really hear each one separately. It, it's a really nice, nice demonstration of this algorithm. Um, and, but, um, so this was, this was their application. It also shows up in learning, I should say, in the learning community. 
Again, different variant, slightly different setting. It's a paper by Fries, uh, German Canaan, 96. And recently, also, these things have been extended also in the, in the um, learning uh, literature. Um, so, yeah, so this is, this is it. This is where it was done. Um, uh, but um, in the paper, in our paper, you can find also rigorous analysis of this, uh, which wasn't present in the previous papers, and application to the, to the crypto, to the, to the attack. Okay, so this was a fun way to to end that uh, project, and uh, I'm ready uh, to say a bit about follow-up work in the few minutes I have. This is mainly, the most important message I guess from this is, you know, so what do you do next? Now you have a signature scheme, it's broken. Okay, so this is not, um, not a, a useful way to, not, not a productive way to end the day, so I should say. Um, there were already uh, suggestions already by Andrew made on something called perturbations, how to, how to modify the algorithm to make it seem more complicated, so they took took this parallel pipe and somehow added more noise to it by rounding to another applying Barclay algorithm twice. It looks something like that. So they kind of do take a Minkowski sum of, of two parallel pipe pits. Um, and it seemed to, it seems still to make things more difficult, but I don't know if it gives, it definitely doesn't give anything provable. Um, so uh, I still, I, I don't know what exactly can be said about that, but recently there's some work of, uh, uh, Leo Duca and the Fong Yen were the sh who showed that you know, even with these perturbations you can still attack and find, uh, find the basis. So, this, um, so apparently these things are not strong enough to prevent attacks on, on the signature scheme. So we need something else, we need something stronger. Um, and um, what we'll see later, we've seen uh, uh, in Chris's talk, this is work by uh, Craig, uh, Chris and Vinod, uh, how to construct signature schemes that are truly, provably uh, secure. And the main idea is, is follow a similar outline GGH, but the main idea is to use something called a Gaussian sample to exactly prevent that problem that we showed that nearby points kind of tell you the shape of the private basis. This is exactly what they're trying to prevent, and you see how, uh, how, this, done, how this is done in Chris's talk. And this is all, thanks. Oh, questions? <laughs> so the question, the question about GGH, if I can prove security of GGH under? Well, let's say no signature price. I see. It's a good question, actually. Is it? Uh, Oh, we don't see it, yeah, but, 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 but it's limited number of signatures, I don't know, yeah. So maybe GJ is still secure if you don't use it too many times. Um, but, you know, like it's, like it's, it's quite limiting. I mean, given that this breaks GJ or entry with only 400 signatures, you know, you don't... Right, so you can have a weaker... Yeah, but I think that good alternative these days, I mean, you know, following GGH, uh, these ideas with valid, uh, good enough, secure alternatives, yeah. The number 400, but that's, that was just from the experiments, or did it have a reason? Why 400? Yes. Experiments. Yeah, actually we were surprised, because it seems so little, like it's not, the dimension is 500, so it seems like too little. I should say this, we initially had something like a few tens of thousands, and there's an idea of uh, William White that said that there's actually some symmetries once you have 400, you can try to rotate them and get more, and somehow it worked wonderfully. We don't know how to analyze it, but in practice, in, in experiments, it really works well. Also, if the dimension grows? Uh, well, we, got, we stopped at 500. Uh, beyond that, uh, we, I'm sure this would work. I mean, I'm sure this would work for a couple of thousand. We haven't tried, but... But still 400 would be, or you don't know. Oh, it, it will grow, I think. But I think it's, it's going to remain the same ballpark. Um, Yeah, so the entry analysis have some symmetries. This is why they're so efficient. This is why they're only 1,700 bits. Um, and you can essentially take them and rotate everything, and you know, you're still in the same address. So you can take also the vectors you find, rotate, and, and get a new vector and for free. You get the extra signatures for free. Yeah.